Bring it to South Wales and perhaps into the Midlands for a time. Certainly a wet evening across the south coast. That rain scooting away by around about midnight. And then we're looking at showers becoming more and more widespread through the night and into Saturday. Uh, temperatures dropping down well into single figures and pockets of frost in rural areas. But the winds will be picking up and that will help stop the temperatures falling too far. But it will bring a cold feel to tomorrow. A day of sunshine and showers. Quite a wet start for Northern Ireland, Central and Southern Scotland. Some snow here over the hills of Southern Uplands. And as that wet weather moves south, over the tops of the Pennines too, but mostly at low levels it'll be rain that we see, but quite a wet afternoon across the northeast of England. It's much of the southeast dry and bright and brightening up through central Scotland, but a cold feel again returns. Single figure temperatures feeling colder with that wind, which is still in evidence on Sunday, but most of us dry on Sunday. Still some showers keeping going though across eastern England. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Good morning and welcome to The Briefing at 9am here on GB News. I'm live in Albexi and Sitcop, where last night the Conservative Party managed to retain the seat here, but with a much reduced ma ma majority, we'll be discussing what it means for British politics and whether the impact of Tory sleaze hasn't really hit home as hard as the opposition would want. Also, we've got an exclusive report from a Home Affairs editor, Mark White, who spent time with anti-terrorism police here in the capital. And also one of the latest on the coronavirus crisis and that new variant. Mixed news overnight, uh, one of the latest of what the science says, what may happen here in the UK in the weeks to come. But before all that, let's get the very latest news at the top of the hour. I'm Rhiannon Jones. This is your news at nine o'clock. One of the UK's most senior counter-terrorism officers has told GB News the public could play a vital role in preventing another terror attack. Scotland Yard's Deputy Assistant Commissioner Matt Twist is urging the public to be extra vigilant in the run-up to Christmas, but he says people shouldn't change their plans. The current terror threat level of severe means another incident is highly likely. After two attacks in a month, enhanced police patrols will be operating in urban centres over the festive period. I mean, this is the first Christmas where, in a couple of years where lots of people are going to be together, there's lots of big events going on, and we want people to go and enjoy them. 
But we also know that the terrorist threat level has been raised to severe after the two awful attacks we've seen, one in Essex and one in Liverpool. And we just want the public to be vigilant. We mean that severe means an attack is highly likely, but it doesn't mean they shouldn't go about carrying on their normal business. What it means is that if you're worried about something, if you're suspicious about something, then tell us about it. The Conservatives have held the seat of Old Bexley and Sidcup in a by-election despite a significantly reduced majority. Local councillor Louis French is the area's new MP with a majority of just under 4,500. That's down from 19,000 in the last election. The death of former Cabinet Minister James Brokenshire triggered the by-election. In his acceptance speech, Mr French promised to continue his work. The killers of six-year-old Arthur Labinio Hughes are due to be sentenced later. Coventry Crown Court found the little boy suffered a campaign of torture before he died of an unsurvivable brain injury in June 2020. Arthur's stepmother, Emma Tustin, was convicted yesterday of murder. His father, 29-year-old Thomas Hughes, was found guilty of manslaughter. The Pfizer and Moderna vaccines give the best overall booster against COVID-19, that's according to a new study. It found that those two jabs led to the most significant rise in immunity levels. The UK trial shows that the body's immune response after a booster jab may provide protection from hospital admission and death. Omicron wasn't tested in the trial, but experts say immunity could mean that boosters offer good protection against the new variant. Retailers are making shocking and completely unjustified profits from fuel prices, a report has found. Motoring organisations, uh, the RAC, says a fall in oil prices is not being reflected at the pumps with major supermarket chains among the biggest offenders. Despite the wholesale price of petrol falling by 10 pence in November, forecourt prices increased to a record high of almost £1.50 per litre. The Prime Minister is sending the army to areas of Scotland and the northeast of England to help those still impacted by Storm Arwen. A week on, around 3,000 homes are still without electricity in the Grampian region of Scotland. Across the UK, an estimated 16,000 homes have no power still. 130 troops will conduct door-to-door -door checks and provide support to remote communities. The Prime Minister of France has formally rejected Boris Johnson's request for British patrols on French beaches to help curb the migrant crisis. Jean Castex says his country can't allow British police officers or soldiers on its soil as it would compromise France's sovereignty. He also says that the UK should offer legal immigration paths into the country, reducing the risk of dangerous channel crossings. However, Mr Castex has offered to examine some of the other proposals put forward. Alec Baldwin has admitted that his career may be over following the death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins on a movie set. In an exclusive first interview since the fatal shooting, Mr Baldwin told ABC News's George Stephanopoulos that he'd cocked the gun but not pulled the trigger. He claims he's not the one at fault. Mr Baldwin says that he constantly thinks about the incident and that he doesn't care about his career anymore. And Manchester United and Portugal forward Cristiano Ronaldo has become the first player to reach 800 top-level goals. The 36-year-old struck twice in Manchester United's 3-2 win against Arsenal to pass the incredible milestone for club and country. The game also saw Michael Carrick's 15-year career at Old Trafford come to an end. He'd been in caretaker charge for their last three fixtures, but announced after the match that he'd be stepping down from his role as first-team coach. I'll be back with the headlines in half an hour, but for now it's back to Darren and the briefing. A very good morning and welcome to Bexley Heath in the old Bexley and Sidcop constituency. Coming up over the next 30 minutes, we'll be live here looking at that by-election result last night where the Conservative Party managed to retain the seat, but with a much reduced majority. We'll be discussing where is the state of politics in Britain today and what potentially might happen in Shropshire in just a couple of weeks' time. 
Also, we've got an exclusive report from of Home Affairs editor Mark White on anti-terrorism. He spent time with anti-terror police here in the capital, warning that people need to be vigilant after those two recent terror attacks. And also mixed news this morning on the Omicron variant. It's suggestions that it can evade prior infection, but that the vaccines may well still be pretty effective. We'll get the latest science in regards to that. As always, though, we want to hear from you on GB News. Do get in touch, gbviews at gbnews.uk, or you can tweet me at gbnews, and we'll get to some of your opinions later in the programme. A very good morning. Welcome to Bexley here on GB News. Well, as we say, the Conservative Party have managed to hold this constituency overnight so with a much reduced majority. James Brokenshaw, of course, was the Conservative MP for this constituency. He managed to get a 19,000-seat majority back in 2019. He sadly passed away of cancer a couple of months ago that sparked this by-election. And the Conservatives did manage to hold the seat last night with Louis French uh, receiving over 50% of the vote, but that majority was cut to 4,000. The big issue, though, was turnout. It was a pretty dark, damp, cold day here in Bexley, and only 34% of people bothered to turn out to vote. Many Conservative voters actually didn't turn out at all. Let's have a look at the current result in the wee small hours of this morning. Uh, well, unfortunately, we don't have that clip. Uh, we had hoped to show you uh, what was said in that result, but let's have a quick look through in terms of what the Conservative Party got. I think uh, they got um, quite a substantial amount of the vote. As I say, uh, they saw that majority route to 4,000, uh, though, which was you know, not ideal uh, from their point of view. They still managed to get 11,189 uh, votes. As I say, that was 51.48% of the vote. Uh, the Labour Party uh, did finish second in the constituency with 6,711 votes. Uh, that's some 31% of the vote. Now, interestingly, the Reform Party did pretty well here. They actually finished uh, third. Uh, Richard Tice was the candidate, of course, the leader of the Reform Party, uh, getting nearly 7% of the vote. They'll be pretty pleased uh, with that result, particularly finishing uh, third here. They have been campaigning, of course, on the restrictions that have been imposed uh, during this coronavirus crisis. Uh, they suggest much uh, of the restrictions, and many of them have been entirely unnecessary. The Liberal Democrats, though, uh, losing their deposit, only getting 3% of the vote. Now, in part, that's because they didn't really properly campaign here. Uh, they decided that actually what they wanted to do was focus on the Shropshire by-election in a couple of weeks' time, where they are the second party, to give Labour a bit of a a bit of a free ride uh, in that regard. So really, really interesting, fascinating result. As I say, it gives a little bit of an insight into the politics here, not just in Bexley, but across the country, in a sense that actually the Tory C scandal hasn't really had the impact maybe that commentators had thought. But being no doubt the big note here was the turnout, only 34%, which is, even by by-election standards, pretty uh, low. Well, we're going to be discussing this throughout the programme. We're going to hear from the former Conservative Cabinet Minister, uh, David Meller, as well. But first, we do want to bring you our top story today, uh, and that is uh, our exclusive report from a Home Affairs editor, Mark White. He's been spending time... So, and he's been on patrol with them. Uh, let's have a look at his exclusive reports. We're on the road with a team from Scotland Yard's Specialist Operations Division, a counter-terrorism patrol in the heart of central London. Stevie, if you know, we're going to go down that little side road for, uh, by the Trocadero. They've been tasked with patrolling parts of the West End on the lookout for anything suspicious. Well, it's, a, it's just a case of the fact that we can get further with the vehicle. Um, you might see different things when you're out on foot, when we're out on the vehicle, but it's, it's a whole package. The deployment includes foot patrols. Hello, guys, how are you doing? Yeah, good, thanks. You. Good, good, thank you. With the terror threat level recently raised to severe, these patrols have taken on added significance. There are also plainclothes covert teams here, reporting back anything that seems out of place. 
So as a project servitor officers, we deploy in unpredictable fashion into areas where there's quite high footfall. Um, as I say, I can't go into specific details on how we work due to security reasons, um, but as you see, you'll see uniformed officers, but we do have a range of assets available to us. It was the terrorist killing of Conservative MP Sir David Amos, followed by the bomb attack outside Liverpool Women's Hospital, that prompted security officials to raise the terror threat level. And so across the country, in the run-up to Christmas in particular, the public are being urged to be extra vigilant. I mean, this is the first Christmas where, in a couple of years where lots of people are going to be together, there's lots of big events going on, and we want people to go and enjoy them. But we also know that the terrorist threat level has been raised to severe after the two awful attacks we've seen, one in Essex and one in Liverpool. And we just want the public to be vigilant. We mean that severe means an attack is highly likely, but it doesn't mean they shouldn't go about carrying on their normal business. What it means is that if you're worried about something, if you're suspicious about something, then tell us about it. And the message is very clear. You, by phoning us, by telling us there's something that doesn't feel right, um, you're not going to ruin somebody's life, but you may just save some. In Manchester, the Christmas markets are highly popular. After a hiatus because of COVID, there is added enthusiasm this year. But an awareness too that crowded places like these are potential targets for terrorists. I feel safe, but then it's a midweek day, so people are more spaced out. I think I'd probably not feel as safe if it was a weekend and it was very crowded. Definitely more vigilant. I tend to, uh, I'm more aware of um, left baggage and things like that. You've just got to crack on. You can't let these things slow you down. Back in London's Leicester Square, another element of these patrols is about raising public awareness of the potential threats. We're part of a security team, Boston Metropolitan Police from Charing Cross Police Station. When you're out today, if you see anything that does look suspicious, no matter what it is, please give us a call. Yeah. Right across the UK and mainly urban centres of population, there will be a noticeable increase in these police patrols. But authorities say, far from being alarmed, the public should be reassured by this enhanced security. With the terror threat level at severe, sadly, authorities know that it is only a matter of when, rather than if, there's another attack. And so the public, they say, have a potentially vital role in spotting anything that might prevent another tragedy. Mark White, GB News. Uh, there we go, that was Mark White, our Home Affairs and Security Editor, with that exclusive report, and you can see further details of that throughout the day here on uh, GB News. Well, let's move on uh, to the coronavirus crisis and, of course, this new variant uh, that we've seen emerge in South Africa in the last couple of weeks, in Southern Africa, I should say. A uh, bit of a mixed package of news overnight with suggestions uh, that... According to early trials, it looks like this virus may be able, or the variant may be able to escape uh, potentially people who have been infected, that they're more likely to be reinfected if they are confronted with the variant. However, there are also some notes of optimism, that is, that the current vaccines in place should still be pretty effective against this variant, particularly uh, those boosters that are now coming into play, Moderna and Pfizer, they're being doled out in their hundreds of thousands across the UK now every uh, single day. This comes, of course, at a time of confused messaging, some would say, from the government about what potentially to do in the run-up uh, to Christmas. Ministers urging caution but suggesting people should carry on with their Christmas plans. Uh, and cases, of course, here in the UK uh, did hit above 50,000 for the first time uh, since July yesterday. We're delighted to say we can speak to uh, Dr. Catherine Milliken Sanders. She's an NHS doctor and an educationalist and joins us down the line. Very good morning uh, to you, Catherine. Thank you for joining us on GB News. Uh, I suppose, first of all, um, how concerned in many regards should we be by that high infection rate yesterday, above 50,000? We were warned rates were going to uh, rise. Hospitalizations, of course, remain uh, relatively stable. Uh, but what's your sense of that rising infection rates? Thank you. Good morning. Well, yes, let's consider the COVID facts as it stands. So we've had over 10 million cases Does in the I need UK to be able already. To <laughs> Catherine, can you hear me OK? I can hear you. Sorry, I thought you said you couldn't hear me. We can indeed. 
Well, apologies for the technical Fantastic. problems. Uh, do carry on. Thank you. So there have been over 10 million cases in the UK already and 145,000 deaths. As you said, there are over 50,000 um, uh, uh, new cases, but on an average week, it was still 43,000. And that's still about 70% of the highest peak in January and only 130, well, only 130 deaths a day. And that's around 10% of the highest peak. We've got 88% of people with their first boost booster and 80% with their second. And we're nearing 40% of people who have got their booster or third dose. As you said, the, the hospital numbers are stable, but we've got 42 new cases of Omicron noted in the UK already. And due to Omicron, we've obviously reintroduced these mandatory masks and tightened our self-isolation. So now this is the question of, do we actually need to start cancelling parties and mass gatherings? I think what's really important is we still don't know all of the facts, and these will be emerging over the next coming weeks. And it's absolutely critical that we stay ahead of the curve. We plan the logistics going forward. Forward. So we need to listen to the scientists because it is it is important that we want to reduce as much as possible a significant wave of infections. And we know the more people have mass gatherings, the more likely they are to become infected, and there's more likely to be associated hospitalizations and potentially deaths alongside that. So what do we have in our toolkit? We still have masks, hand washing, social distancing, avoiding situations where the virus can spread. And obviously it's on a business by business basis and people, individual basis and their own judgment. But we do have these booster vaccinations. So I would just urge anyone that hasn't had, had it, please, if you are waiting to get the call, then please do call contact your GP practice, make sure you're on the, the right list, make sure your contact details are up to date and that you'll be getting that booster as soon as possible. The other part is the rate limiting step is the capacity of staff and particularly primary care staff and GPs. So these logistics are important and we have to deliver this mass vaccine program of boosters again just before Christmas or coming up to Christmas. So GP teams need to be ready. We're already at capacity and normal business of of looking after our patients is also equally incredibly important. So we can either free up time of our GPs for several weeks to make sure we can boost the booster numbers, um, or we've also got teams of St. John ambulance staff and large numbers of volunteers that have already been trained that we basically need to be able to enable to enact the logistics as soon as possible. But recognizing it does take time and um, we do need to have some patients balanced with with understanding the uncertainty of Omicron that we will see develop in the next couple of weeks with scientists' advice. In saying that, uh, Catherine, there is concern. I mean, these are only early trials, but potentially that people who've already been infected could be reinfected much easily with the Omicron uh, variants. And there is a sense in Britain, wasn't there, that actually we've built up a level of herd immunity here that might be a bit of a buffer, uh, but that might not be in doubt with this variant. Is that your understanding? How much of a concern is that? I think the scientists have made it clear already we have emerging evidence and I think we have to, it's really frustrating not necessarily having all of the details. That will come out over the next few weeks and we'll be able to respond to that depending on what the scientists guide us on. Uh, we do know that there's potentially increase, increased transmissibility, so that means you're more likely to catch it from people. Um, it does, there is the possibility that the vaccine may not be as um, active against it, but that evidence is still going to be emerging. So I don't think we can yet say that. Uh, what we can do is stay ahead of the curve. And to do that, we need to respond to being as sensible as possible, wearing our masks at the right time, socially distancing where possible, and um, also getting our booster vaccination. We are much more likely to have uh, sufficient herd immunity with the more people that are vaccinated for their boosters. And also if they haven't had their first and second vaccine to make sure that they're up to date. And that is going to be our best line of defense against our current en enemy of COVID. And just very finally, uh, Catherine, this comes somewhat at the worst possible time, doesn't it? We know the NHS is already under strain. We know there's a massive backlog of cases. There's concern about people not referring themselves uh, for cancer treatments or referrals. And we've got the winter descending upon us, which is normally the worst time of the year or the most difficult time for the National Health Service. And now we've got this booster programme and concerns about a variant. 
can the NHS cope? It, it does seem like this is going to be an incredibly difficult winter for the National Health Service. I think it's a critical time and I think I'd like to applaud all of our GPs, all our primary care staff, everybody in the NHS that is working above and beyond. Also, you know, we've got our ambulance staff, we've got uh, teams of volunteers. We are, however, in a much better position um, with understanding the virus, which we weren't necessarily at this time last year. And we've also got vaccines that we're able to now deliver. And so we've got increasing emerging evidence of what Omicron is actually going to, how it's going to affect us. And that will be coming out in the next couple of weeks. So I think we just need to um, stay calm and make sure that we get as much uh, defense as possible, get our booster vaccination get our first and second doses if we haven't, and make sure that we're following the best lines and evidence as we possibly can to keep the threat as minimal as possible. OK, really appreciate your thoughts and analysis this morning. That's uh, Dr Catherine Milligan-Sanders, who's an NHS doctor and educationist, joining us down the line with the latest on the Omicron variant and the concerns, of course, about the National Health Service. Appreciate your time. Well, as I say, we're live this morning in Old Bexley and Sitcup, where there was that by-election last night. The results came through in the wee small hours. The Conservative Party managing to hold on here. Let's have a look as the results came in. The number of votes recorded for each candidate in said election is as follows. Cheeseman Elaine Francis, English Democrats, put in England first, 271. Francis Daniel, Labour Party, 6,711. <laughs> French Louis Thomas, the Conservative Party candidate, 11,189. <laughs> Well, that was the election result, as it was announced, as I say, in the wee small hours of this morning. Now, the Conservative Party did manage to hold on uh, to the seat, as you saw, though, with a very, very much reduced uh, majority. I was suggesting that it doesn't look like the sleaze allegations really have had that much of an impact, though turnout was uh, significantly low. One viewer's got in touch, though, saying that I'm completely ignoring the elephant in the room, and that is that illegal immigration and broken manifesto commitments are the real reason uh, why. Uh, now, we did manage to hear from the Conservative winner last night, Louis French. Uh, he spoke on the stage, uh, clearly pretty pleased with the victory. I'm incredibly proud of the campaign uh, my team and I have run based on local issues that matter to the people who live here. And tonight, those people have sent a clear message. They want an MP who will work with the government to deliver on their priorities. My focus will now be delivering on those promises that I made during the campaign. Getting our fair share of London's police officers. Securing more investment for local schools and hospitals protecting our precious green spaces and standing up to the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, and his proposals for out of London tax, plans that would hit businesses, key workers and local families here in Bexley and across London. 
So Labour did pretty well here last night. I think there was a 10% swing from the Conservatives to Labour. But in the grand scheme of things, no sense of a breakthrough moment. So what did the opposition uh, make of this? Well, our reporter, uh, Alice Porter, uh, managed to catch up with the Labour candidate uh, to have a little word with him about what he felt uh, about the results and how it had gone. The result for Labour today is a swing of over 10%. Um, it was a significant challenge to overturn the size majority of 19,000. We've got that down to 4,500. And the swing here, would, um, if that was replicated across the country, would wipe out you know, a very large number of Conservative MPs and take Labour back on a path to government. What do you think was the main advantage to you as a party in this by-election? Because, as you say, there has been an increase in Labour votes that we, from 2019. What do you think was the advantage that you had this time? Um, well, not just since 2019. It's the biggest percentage share of the vote we've had here since 2001. Um, and we, there was a number of issues. You know, in, in myself, we had an experienced local candidate that was well-known in the community. But equally, we saw great dissatisfaction with local Conservative Council and the cuts they've made this year. And in recent weeks, time after time, we've heard from residents how dissatisfied they are with the Prime Minister, how um, he's emboldened with sleaze, and particularly in the last week or two, how incompetent the residents of Olbeck since he believe the Prime Minister is. Well, one party that will be pretty pleased with the result is the Reform Party, headed up by Richard Tice. He was the candidate here in Obexley and Sidcop. They did particularly well, getting 6.5% of the vote. They finished third. Alice also caught up with Richard for his reaction. So, Richard, you've come, your party have come third today. How are you feeling about the result? We're delighted. And tonight, the British political landscape has changed because now there are five parties... We've beaten the Libs and the Greens. We've secured a whisker under as many votes as them put together. And for us, this is, it's a foundation stone firmly planted into British politics. And it's like a springboard for us into the next by-election, which is just two weeks away. And you know, this result tonight was, it was a tribute to an amazing individual, the late James Brokenshire. I heard some amazing stories on the doorstep, really emotional. Um, but the next election, is very, very different. So for us, yes, this is a springboard. Uh, we've put a, a, a flag in British politics. We're here to stay. And then after the next by-election, it'll be into the May elections, and we'll be standing 600 candidates at the next general election. And the other thing about this by-election, bearing in mind the Tories secured nearly 20,000 less votes than just two years ago, this is a rejection of Boris Johnson, who many, many lifelong Tory voters told me on the doorstep they wouldn't vote Conservative again until that man has gone. He is a liability, not only for the Tory party, but frankly, for this country. And extraordinarily, when one of our allies, the president of one of our allies, Monsieur Macron, described him as a clown, actually, I think that's what his own voters here in Old Bexley and Sidcup have also said. He's a liability, and it's really, really sad for our country that we're being led by this individual, a man uh, who seems to only look after himself and you know we're a great nation and at the moment we're being very badly led. But of course with such a low turnout I mean to have half what we would normally have in the 2019 election to have only 34 percent it does make it very hard to make any generalization about how poorly no, the Conservatives it, have done. It, actually it's very simple it is a rejection by the Tory party voters of their own Prime Minister that's what that low turnout is that's quite extraordinary um, and I think many, many Tory MPs will now be looking over their shoulders and thinking, actually, this fifth force in British politics is going to cause them a lot of problems because people want choice. Democracy is better when there's more debate, more discussion, more options on the table, more choice. We now clearly provide that choice. And let's remember, just five weeks ago, almost nobody here in Old Bexley and Seacup had heard of Reform UK. They've heard of us now. They've put us third. And I think it's onwards and upwards. Their all attention now will return to the next by-election in just a couple of weeks in uh, Shropshire. It's going to be a key one uh, with the Lib Dems insisting they are making significant gains. Of course, it's Owen Paterson's former constituency. A sense there that the Conservative Party, unlike here in Bexley, could actually be in trouble. But that is it from all Bexley and Sidcup on the briefing this morning. We'll be back with analysis uh, throughout the morning here on uh, GB News. Uh, apologies for some of the technical program problems during uh, the programme, but hopefully I've brought some 
least festive cheer in my attire. Uh, Isabel is back with the briefing at 12. Arlene Foster here at 3. I'll be back on Monday morning at 9am. Please join me then. Up next, it is To The Point with Patrick and Anaya. Stay tuned for that first. Here's the weather for the weekend from the Met Office down in Exeter. See you soon. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Good morning. A bit of a north-south split with the weather today, with much of the south fairly drab, whereas further north, brighter skies are likely with some sunshine coming through at times. Not completely dry, however, even here there will be some showers around. This set of weather fronts moved across the country overnight, springing for a time a little bit of snow in places too. That is clearing away and it's also bringing warmer air with it, this set of weather fronts. So temperatures quickly rising across the south and staying fairly dull and damp across East Anglia in the southeast this morning before more rain returns to the 